know you do a lot of uh, of consulting with teachers, and you run Gaming Matter, mm -hmm. uh, and you do workshops for teachers. Can you talk a little bit about how that worked, what kind of response you get, what are some of the challenges that you encounter? There's a lot of folks that'll say that there's pushback, that mm -hmm. teachers are pushing back or they're resisting change. Mm -hmm. um, being a former teacher and a former principal, I just don't buy it. I don't think there is pushback. I don't think that that, I think what's going on right now in schools is we're not providing the tools that back up our theories. So we're saying that, say, gaming media is an important element of learning and, we, and we're, and, and there's some wonderful research like showing exactly how powerful that, that is. And when I talk to teachers and present that, it's pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. And the response that I would get again and again and again from teachers is like, okay, we buy it, but we're not gonna go be gaming experts. We want you to make some tools that make this usable for us in the classroom. Right. I really feel, feel like the same thing is true of administrators and leaders in schools today, policy makers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it, you know, you want to, so database decision making is a result of new and innovative technologies, right? Mm -hmm. right? This idea that we use data at a local level to push decision making and school change, it's a movement that's really rooted in, in high-end computer technology, the ability to capture data. Yet we don't give principals and teachers tools to process and visualize the data in a meaningful way. We expect them to be data experts. Okay. So we're really asking our teachers to not just be teachers, but to be data experts. Mm -hmm. um, and to some degree, the pushback that people are identifying, I think is a really reasonable thing to say, which is, I'm a teacher, I'm a principal, I'm a school superintendent, I'm here to work with people and, and create these environments. Database decision making is an element of what I do, it's not what I do. You do hear a lot of hype about how basically parents are concerned about using video games to teach their kids. You know, what, do you think that that's a real thing? Do you, what do you think are uh, some of the issues surrounding that? I think some of the issues is just flat out ignorance. I, I really, I. I Parents that have taken time to find out what their kids are doing and playing right. um, are passionate about it. Um, my experience, and it's a small experience, but my experience with parents is that they're thankful that we're, we're validating some of these learning spaces. Well, that's a good, that's a good point. Um, so I think I'm unique in that. I, I respect the fact that there's other researchers that have had resistance or anger from parents. Usually it's based around not knowing what the heck they're talking about mm -hmm. or this fear of safety. If, if we have a, so if safety becomes our dominating value around any technology, let's say the technology of sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Sidewalks get chips in them, right? And you can trip and fall and skid your hands and, and scrape them up. So if my, if my primary value with sidewalks is safety, then I outlaw sidewalks. The solution isn't to outlaw sidewalks, <laughs> it's to put band-aids in your cupboard. It's sure. to deal with things as they arise. If I trip and fall, I have, I have a way to deal with that. So for parents and teachers, you know, there's that immediate safety question. I don't think that's a resistance point. I think it's a valid question. What if my kid does something on the internet that's not okay? And that, you know, the real kind of the, the beauty of that is the solution isn't to outlaw the internet. The solution is to have some sort of way to deal with kids that screw around with it. Right. So if a kid does something wrong, you deal with that kid. You don't punish the other 99%. Most kids are perfectly um, aware that there's things they should and shouldn't do when they're in a school space or a learning space or when they're doing anything with adults. If teachers make the simple change of just running the computers around the outside walls, right. they can stand in the middle and kids don't do dumb things because they know their teacher can see the screen. Yep. There's I've noticed that myself. So there's design choices that mm -hmm. get made around even just the classroom space and just sure. telling teachers if you're setting up a computer lab, force your tech people to do it like this, mm -hmm. then that design choice solves a lot of behavior problems. So teachers don't resist computers or running, working in a lab. They resist having to deal with issues with kids because the design is bad. Schools buy technology because it's hot or it's sexy. Right. But they should buy technology because they want to do specific cool things with students. Mm -hmm. And at that point, there's no resistance. There's zero mm -hmm. resistance. John Tanner in uh, uh, Oregon, Wisconsin is an administrator who I've gone down and I've been able to talk to and he has a whole program with no technology in that district gets purchased without a lesson plan showing a need for the technology. What do you think is the future of, uh, of using mobile for learning and specifically what you've been doing with your work in Minnesota in this area? Okay. The Minnesota Historical Society um, found uh, the heiress group of, of people here in Minnesota and then they found Gaming Matter and they kind of hunted me down to, to do this and what we've been doing is uh, they've been working on how to rethink field trips. Like field trips are pretty cool to start out with. Like, you know, they're the day off. They're the vacation days. So students generally like field trips, but they kind of said the, the question like, we think we can do better. You know, field trips were also designed a long time ago. And they're, and they're usually designed around this kind of like this linear trip through the 
through the space with big glass cases where you can't actually touch things. So museums have gotten more and more experiential, more and more manipulatives are being thrown in, interactives are what they call them. So they kind of ask the question like, wouldn't it be interesting if our interactive was the exhibit? If we didn't do it as an afterthought, but we did it as the whole exhibit. So we have 14,000 square feet to actually make scenes from this game that we're designing where when we send a kid into a cave, we're gonna they're gonna build out the cave and there's gonna be sound effects and characters inside the cave. It's called Our Minnesota. It should release uh, in the fall of 2012. <laughs>